to the next topic of nonlinear programming, which is the new handout that you have. And the, the rest of this new section, um, at least for today's class, is really just review. I know you've done this in 3E, um, so we're going to look at some very basic optimization in a single variable. Okay, and so here the, the key point is that um, when we're looking at this particular problem, I'm going to start off with only one degree of freedom. We've got one search variable. This is your classic problem that you've seen where you have a function in terms of one variable, call it x. You have a function f of x, and it's nonlinear. There's a single optimum. That's what we're dealing with. We're not even going to put constraints on here just yet. Constraints we'll come, come back to later. The reason is, is quite simple, um, why we won't look at constraints for now. Let me just give you a hypothetical example here to, to think about. If we're producing a product in a reactor that requires heating, so think of your classical CSTR with some heat source, Okay, uh, you could look at this from the objective to maximize profit. And my search variable, subject to x, x is going to be the heat input. Let's, let's say we measure it in kilowatts, for example. And a hypothetical function that would model the system quite well would be something like like that where as you increase your heat input so this is heat goes up you get faster reaction so you create more product in a shorter amount of time so your profit potentially goes up Okay, so that's increasing x, you'll, you'll create more product in a faster time, you can sell it more, you'll you create, create more product. But there is, of course, some point where you don't get that benefit anymore. You're putting in so much, there's so much heat that the cost of heat exceeds your profit on your product. Okay and then your profit starts to drop. So your net profit, when you take into account not only what you're selling over here, but also the cost of your utilities, starts to outweigh that benefit, right? If we never had this sort of issue in real life, companies would just go all out, right? But no company produces at sort of like an unlimited capacity, right? Because there's supply and demand issues, there's finite resources for utilities, now, the reason why I wanted to look at constraints, why we don't need to consider constraints just yet, is because there's two very obvious constraints. The first obvious constraint is you have to put in at least more than zero kilowatts of heat. Right? But that constraint is never going to be active. Right? You're not going to get an optimum where that constraint is, is met. Right? Because when you're putting in no heat, you're not even getting a reaction. You're not even creating product. And so it's an obvious constraint that's not met. And let's say this heater that you're using here has very high capacity that you can essentially put in up to some very large maximum amount of heat. But this is the heater capacity. Okay, so the heater is maybe capable of a very high amount of kilowatts. But our optimum is unlikely to be influenced by either of those two constraints. And so we can actually just ignore them. So a key point about constraints is in nonlinear programming is that they can be neglected, but you should always check for feasibility afterwards. Okay. So regarding your constraints, 
is they can be neglected, <coughs> but check for feasibility afterwards, at the very least. Okay. Now, the other key way we're going to solve these is I'm going to look only at derivative-based methods here for now. We'll come back to some of these other two later on. But derivative-based methods are very intuitive for us. When we've studied calculus, uh, let me just strip off some of this annotation here. When we've studied calculus for a generic function, f of x, Okay, so there's my f of x. We recall and know from calculus that the optimum is at the top of the mountain here, right? So, and the optimum will always have the tangent plane to the function horizontal. So at your optimum, we know that f dash of x will equal 0. Okay. So this is a key, a key result. that we're going to actually make our, li makes our lives a lot easier. You've converted your problem from finding the maximum of this function f of x to a different problem that you can easily solve. You've converted your problem to finding the zero of a function. So take the derivative of the function, set it equal to zero. If you can solve that, and 3e4 had a lot of section covering so finding the zeros of functions, Right, you looked at, at search methods, you looked at Newton's method. Any one of those methods can be used to now solve this problem instead. The moment you solve f dash of x equal to 0, you've solved your original problem. Okay. Maybe let me um, look at it, for those of you just a little bit algebraically, let me say, pretend that, for example, f of x was a simple quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, f dash of x is equal to 2ax plus b. That's the equation of a straight line. Okay, so in this particular example for f of x, here in black is f of x. In blue then, the slope here at the beginning is positive, so f of x will be a positive number. And as I get climb up this mountain, my slope gets less positive and less positive and less positive. At the peak of that mountain, it crosses zero. And if I go any further, that slope is negative. So we've converted our problem from solving, finding the peak of the black function to finding where f dash of x crosses zero. You solve one, you've solved the other. Now, we're going to use Newton's method to find the solution to f dash of x equals 0. So let's just quickly recap this. This is not new. So over the page on, on your handout, Newton's method proceeds um, quite simply as saying, take your function f of x and we're going to create the Taylor series expansion for it up to a polynomial second order, second order polynomial. So we're going to say f of x is approximately p of x. Now, just to emphasize that p of x, that's a second order polynomial approximation. So p of x is exactly then equal to, and we, when we do the Taylor series expansion, remember 
we'll always do the Taylor series around a given point. So I'm going to use a generic point xk. So xk, just so that you can note it here, xk is a fixed point. So it's some constant plus the derivative of that function evaluated at xk times x minus xk. Okay, so just take a look at that square bracket term. x is the thing that is varying. xk is fixed. So make note of that. That's varying. And xk is fixed. That's a first order polynomial approximation. We can take it up to a second order polynomial approximation plus a half f dash of xk times x minus xk squared. So we've expanded and made an equivalent polynomial that should closely match our function around this point xk. So I said, well, if we're trying to optimize f of x, we can now change our problem to optimizing p of x. And let's take dp of x, dp dx, and set that equal to 0. Right? So instead of setting f df of x to 0, we set dp of x to 0. This first term is a constant. Okay, so the constant, that's 0, plus the next term over there is an expansion of two terms. So that's f dash at xk. And then the last term over there, the second order term is equal to f double dash of xk. times x minus xk. OK, so we can solve this quite easily. It says solve, set this to 0, a constant value, f dash of xk, a constant value of the function evaluated at the second derivative times x minus xk. So in other words, we're going to find this x that sets this equation equal to 0. Single equation, single unknown. Okay. So what Newton's method does is it says, well, let's evaluate that. I'm going to evaluate this at some point xk plus 1. I'm just setting up Newton's algorithm here for you. So sub in wherever I see x, sub in xk plus 1. So 0 is f dash of xk plus second derivative of f with respect to xk multiplied by xk plus 1 minus xk. The key part I want to show you then is that bracket. Let's just simplify for the square bracket here. I'm going to call that delta x. That's going to be my step size is equal to xk plus 1 minus xk. So I'm going to define that there as delta x is quite simple. And you, this is the part that I know you've seen before is the negative first derivative of f in the numerator divided by the second derivative of x in the denominator. OK, so our Newton step then, as it's called, is delta x is the first derivative of x over the second derivative of x. Very simple, deceivingly simple algorithm. OK, so let's, uh, how, much, how are we doing for time here? We've got a few minutes. OK, we've got four or five minutes. Let's apply this then. I'll show the application of Newton's method Again, this is not, um, not new, but 
it's helpful to just quickly have a revision of this and then in next class we're going to expand this to more than one variable. So we're going to start here with some initial guess x, x of k x naught at 30 so I'm starting somewhere at this point if I evaluate that function f of x at that location I get a value of minus 40 over there you can sub in and verify that take a minute then and calculate f dash of x and f the second derivative of f at 30 so Newton's algorithm says that xk plus 1 is equal to xk plus delta x or in other words xk plus 1 is your current value of x plus this delta x. Well delta x I just showed you is the first derivative over the second derivative. Okay, I'll write it up here on the other board for those of you that can't see that side. So Newton's method says start with some initial guess here for xk, calculate the first and second derivative at that location, and update your estimate for x. Okay, so any, uh, just keep working through that table, go through the first row, and sub in and see what you get for delta x. Um, yes or no? We'll we'll talk about when one is more efficient than the other coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Computers are very good at automatically finding derivatives. Anyway, so yeah. We'll look at that in next class. Okay, so in this example, f dash of x in general would be equal to 0 0.008 x minus 20 cubed minus 2. Okay, and if you evaluate f dash of x at x equals 30, you should get an answer of 6. Okay, so the first, uh, non, this uh, third, fourth column, I should say, fourth column in the first row is plus 6. Oh, 0.5 times, oh, sorry, my mistake. Oh, okay, then that number's going to be wrong. I used a slightly different example, so 0, 0.05 would be, yeah, thanks. Okay, what is the f dash of x then? 18. Okay, so it's going to be three times larger than what I have. Okay, the second derivative of x is equal to be 0 0.02 times 3 and evaluated at 30 you get a value of six yes no yeah.
sorry, uh, 0, 0.0, okay, uh, <laughs> I see what you're saying, okay. And then the answer is six, okay, thanks. Um, so that then means that our delta x is equal to the first number 18 minus 18 over 6. Okay. So then the next iteration, xk, k now becomes 1. So x of k equals to 1 is equal to the prior value 30 minus 3 is equal to 27. So your next row, that first column, x of k, is, t is now 27. No, let's, uh, let's pay careful attention here. You don't define the step. This is the key, key point from Newton's method. The step is calculated for you. This is the step over here. You How does the computer know what the first and second terms are? They subtract the next value or the previous value? So you calculate f of x. You calculate f dash of x. So when you do these, when the computer calculates this for you, you give it f of x, you give it f dash of x, and you give it the second derivative of, it, of f. Yeah, we're going to see next class how you, you don't have to provide the derivatives, but for this particular implementation, that's your step size, right? Okay. So you should finish that table. You should see it converges in about two to three iterations. Um, you get to your optimum. Like Joseph said, next class we'll relax this requirement where you don't need to know f of x, uh, f dash of x, and the second derivative of it. Question: um, The orange juice example that you gave us, yeah. how is that not an allocation problem or an allocation model? Um, here you're taking a finite resource and splitting it up into various uses. This particular example, you're buying certain amounts of orange juice and you're buying certain amounts of concentrates. You're buying X1 is your tons of oranges that you buy, and this one is you're buying concentrates. But isn't this the same thing like the Saudi, uh, the Saudi and Venezuelan world example? Uh, they have different yeah. So in the Saudi and Venezuelan examples, you're buying various crudes and they get blended in different ratios in your plant. Yeah. This is like, you could choose not to ever buy concentrates and you can still meet the requirements. You're just buying, you're just buying fresh oranges, squeezing them and selling them. But in this particular example, there's an optimum where you buy some concentrates, some fresh oranges, blend that juice amount and sell that juice for, a, a, uh, for a, the same price. I just have to read it a bit more. Yeah, it's, 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 it's true. The distinction between allocation, blending, and sorry, allocation and planning problems is fairly, it is there, but it's not an easy one to, like, the yeah. first time. And also for the sensitivity analysis that we did in the last class, um, you said that if you, if you find a fraction or if you add them up uh, with other fractions, yeah. it shouldn't be more than 100%. Right. Otherwise, it's invalid. Yeah. Right, because the normal the normal way of using the sensitivity analysis is to only move one variable at a time. Yeah. Just saying, if you'd like to check more than one variable moving at a time, you have to use the hundred percent rule. So the sum of the moves can't add up to a hundred more what than. What if it's just one of the moves? Then it, then you're back to the original case that we started off in the prior class, where you're just change. Remember, all the prior classes, I was only looking at changing one variable at a time. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you're changing one variable at a time, but you're changing it 100 percent, is that a violation? No, no, because you can go up to 100 percent. Oh, but if you go more, then yeah, then 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 you've got to resolve the problem. Resolve the problem. Yeah. Now, if you move one variable 50 percent and another variable 50 percent, you're still within your bounds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, and this applies, and we're doing that for the B, uh, the B matrix, right? Or yeah. The, the B right hand side of the coefficients. Yeah. But does that also apply to the C matrix? It applies to the C vectors, but you can't mix and match. You can't move some of B and some of C. Yes, we just stick with one. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, you could use one of the